your Bibles to that passage in Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to read the first 11 verses when you find that. But before we read that, I just want to give you some introductory thoughts. You know, I once read a story about a little boy who uh, had to miss church one Palm Sunday because of illness. So his mother stayed home to take care of him, but his father went ahead and went to church. And when his father came home, sure enough, there the, the boy was, still sick on the couch. And the young boy noticed that when his father came home, he was carrying a large palm branch. And so curiously, he asked, hey, Dad, what's up with the palm branch? And his dad says, well, today's Palm Sunday, son. You see, um, when Jesus came into town, uh, everybody waved these palm branches to honor him. So we all got palm branches today. And, well, the little boy was frustrated that he missed the celebration. And he said, that's just my luck, Dad. The one Sunday I miss church, and that's the Sunday that Jesus shows up. <laughs> Uh, do, do you ever feel like that you missed church on the Sunday that Jesus showed up? Uh, well, that brings me to an important question today before we read our master text. Why are we here? And why are we here on this particular Sunday? Well, in endeavoring to answer that question, let's go ahead and refer to our master text first. And let's go ahead and stand as we honor the reading of God's holy, majestic word. This is the account of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus. Verse 1, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone, if anyone says anything to you, tell him the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the field, the foal of a donkey. And, and that's quoting from uh, one of the Old Testament prophetic books hundreds of years before. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of, of, of him and uh, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, "Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest!" When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, "Who is this?" The crowds answered, "Answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee." And all God's people say. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, if you would. Well, a lot of people don't really know what Palm Sunday is all about. It's often called the triumphal entry of Jesus. But as I think you'll learn today, it's actually about a lot of things. In a way, it's like a, it's like a birthday that you celebrate when you're getting a little older than you want to be. You know... You're happy about the celebration, of course, but you know that you're that much closer to D-Day. In the same way, when Jesus traveled that road to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, he embraced that as a day of celebration as well, but he also had the impending knowledge weighing on his heart that in just a few days, he would lay down his life. So... Palm Sunday was bittersweet for Jesus in that way. Well, today is the day on our calendar called Palm Sunday as well. It's a day we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which paved the way for the most significant event in history, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do today is teach some things about Palm Sunday that you may have never known before, and then I want to uh, draw some parallels um, concerning how this affects us today. So, as I mentioned at the start of our worship time, that term Hosanna is actually a compound word of two Hebrew words, uh, Yasha and Na. And 
they mean, that compound word put together, Hosanna, means save, we pray. Or we pray, save us, is another way to say that. It's literally a cry for salvation. But the term eventually morphed into an expression of celebration as well. Which is why when Jesus came to town, they were crying out, save us, we pray. But they were also celebrating the arrival of the Savior. So essentially, the crowd was saying to Jesus, we celebrate because our Savior has come. But did they really know what they were saying? Evidently, few did. See, they got caught up in the the celebration because they knew about Jesus' miracles. They had heard about those. And they most likely wanted to get in on the loaves and the fishes and the healings. Yet it was this same crowd that just five days later were chanting, crucify him. You see, they were looking for a conquering king to save them from Roman occupation from Israel. But Jesus didn't come for that. He came for a much higher purpose than that. He came, of course, to save all of mankind from the occupation of Satan and the domination of sin in the world. And when Jesus didn't give the Jews the kind of salvation that they wanted, they chanted for his execution. Now, this is a very important observation, ladies and gentlemen, so I want to give you some ways that this applies to you and me today. So the first point that I want to bring out, and this is in your notes, you can fill in the little blanks here. Sometimes Jesus may come to us in a form that we don't expect or even like. See, the Jews were looking for a conquering king to come riding in on a majestic horse and a military um, entourage with him to conquer Rome. But that's not the way that Jesus came at all. He came very humbly. As a matter of fact, some people even doubted that Jesus could be the Messiah because they didn't understand that the Messiah would come out of a little seemingly God-forsaken town called Nazareth. And some people even said when Jesus, they found out that Jesus was from Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? So they didn't like the packaging of the Messiah. So this can be true in our lives as well. Sometimes Jesus may come to us in a form that we don't expect or even like. Well, like how? All right, so let me just give you one of endless different examples that I could use on this. Well, let's say that you're praying for breakthrough and to be used by God in a bigger way. So Jesus answers your prayer by bringing out an intimidating looking pair of pruning shears and starts to prune things out of your life. He may prune a person out of your life, for an example, who can't go where you're going. And while that friendship or relationship maybe isn't sinful, it's hindering you in some way and has to be pruned back so that you can flourish. See, you may not see how that relationship is affecting you, but God does. And so the answer to your prayer may at first be painful. I love this quote here by, I'm probably going to butcher this name, uh, Anna Mika Singh, but I love this quote. Some things break your heart, but fix your vision. Wow. Boy, have I ever learned the truth of that statement. Some things break your heart, but fix your vision. What's that mean? It gives you wisdom. Is anybody with me? So sometimes Jesus comes in the form, for example of a harsh rebuke by someone that's designed by God to get your attention. Now, I've used an example before that I want to use again just because it's such a perfect example of this point. I can't think of a better one, so I'm going to use this again. But we all know who Benjamin Franklin was, one of the the founders um, of this nation and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a brilliant, giant intellect of a man. And he was a very brilliant, smart, young man as well. But when he was a young man, he was very arrogant. 
and didn't have a whole lot of social grace. And so one of his friends pulled him aside one day and he looked him in the eye and he said, Ben, you are impossible. Your opinions have a slap in them for everyone who disagrees with you and people find that they enjoy themselves more when you are not around. That's a pretty harsh rebuke, isn't it? But you know what? Rather than Benjamin Franklin getting angry, he took that rebuke to heart and he became one of the most diplomatic people uh, in the history of early America. So it transformed him. There's a similar story about Abraham Lincoln along those same lines as well. Uh, Rather than to resist and react to a strong rebuke, sometimes we need to take it to heart and say, you know what, maybe there's some truth in this. So sometimes Jesus comes in the form of a harsh rebuke that's designed by him to get your attention about something. My point is that we have to be willing to accept Jesus in whatever way he presents himself. Sometimes Jesus comes to comfort and encourage us. That's part of our relationship with him too, no doubt. But sometimes he has to say some hard things to us, like he did with the disciples on numerous occasions. Second point I want to make here is that we have to make room for Jesus if we're actually going to benefit from his arrival. We have to make room for Jesus. You know, that crowd in Jerusalem was excited that the miracle man had come to town. And they got caught up in the celebration, and it was right for them to celebrate his arrival, of course. But the majority of those people didn't really make room in their hearts for Jesus. See, their celebration was self-centered because of the anticipation of what they felt like they were going to get out of him. The loaves and the fishes, the miracles. But it's only the people that made room in their hearts for Jesus that really benefited from his arrival. You know, folks, it's possible to be a churchgoer and yet, nevertheless, not make a whole lot of room in your hearts for Jesus. We have to make time and honor his presence. And when we do, he'll set up residency in our hearts and our homes. And that's when we really begin to benefit from his arrival. A couple of weeks ago, I visited a church out of town. And I was very distracted by a young man, teenage young man, sitting on the front row next to his parents. Because from the start of that service to the end of it, he had his head down. And it didn't take too long to figure out that he wasn't praying and he wasn't reading his Bible, but he was on his cell phone. From the start of the service to the end of it, right next to his parents, on the front row. So, you know, that young man clearly did not make room in his heart for Jesus. So he didn't benefit from the presence of the Lord that day. Do you want to know how to have more of God in your life? It's really quite simple. Simply make efforts to draw closer to him and he'll meet you in the middle. That's why James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, the more that we draw close to God, the more he draws close to us. And there's no stopping point. There's no point that we say, okay, well, that's good enough, because there's always another level in your relationship to God. I don't care if you've been saved 30, 40, 50 years. Don't rest on your laurels. There's always more of God to discover. There's always another level to get close to Him. So draw near to God and keep drawing near to God, and He will keep drawing near to you. Hallelujah. So I want to ask you, Are you paying attention to the road in your spiritual life? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, when you're driving, it's so tempting to look and handle our cell phones, as you see there in that image on the screen. You know, cell phones are not evil, of course, depending on how you use them, but the lure of those shiny screens can distract us from what's most important, right? And when driving, 
clearly the most important thing to have your eyes on is the road. And the most important thing to have your hands on is the steering wheel. And if you let yourself get distracted from what's most important while you're driving by things that are less important, it has the potential to end in disaster for both you and the people around you. Well, there's a spiritual lesson there as well. So important. I want you to lean in right now and really, really get this. There's a lot of things, folks, that vie for our attention in this world. And many of them are not wrong or sinful in and of themselves, but they can get in the way of what's most important in your life. And if you let that continue to happen, you may just look around someday and kick yourself for not paying more attention to what's most important, like your family and your God. And that lack of attention, by the way, to what's most important is not only affecting you on a personal level, but it's affecting the people around you. That's why it says in Hebrews 12, 1, look at the screen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance. Some versions say hindrance. And the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let me go through that again really quick. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what's that mean? People that have gone on to heaven before us. And according to what the wording here suggests, and the Bible doesn't specifically give us the details about this, but that wording right there suggests that perhaps there are times when the people that have gone on before us to heaven can look down over the banister of heaven, if you will, if you want to use that wording, and look in on us from time to time to cheer us on. Yeah, go ahead. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, I, I just... Mylon Lefevre and I had a little bit of a long-distance friendship, and, and I was making some tea this morning when I got up, and... I put my phone on, on, on um, Apple Music, and one of his songs came up, one of my favorite ones, Holy is the Lord. And I just, I just began thanking the Lord for Mylon and what he was in my life and the music and what he meant. And, and uh, I, just, I told the Lord, I said, hey, Lord, could you tell Mylon I said hello? And then I said, while you're at it, could you tell Wilma, my mother-in-law, I said hello? And could you tell my mom, Hi. So, yeah, I believe that there are times when, when they can look over the banister of heaven and look in on us from time to time. That wording there in Hebrews 12, 1 suggests that. But let's go through this again. There, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance or hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Those are two different things. Throw off every encumbrance. That's talking about things that are not necessarily always sinful, but hinder us nevertheless. And the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race set out for us. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up. When things look like this Christian thing isn't working out for me, don't give up. Because you will reap in time if you don't give up. In liturgical churches like the Catholics, they celebrate a season called Lent, which is a derivative of a Latin word that means to lengthen because it happens when the days begin to get longer. And it's a time of um, personal reflection and asking for forgiveness and a time when we're se uh, preparing to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which consummates at the end of that Lent season, which I think is 40 days, with the celebration called Easter, or what we like to call Resurrection Sunday around here. Now, during Lent, many people decide to give up something that they love during that 40-day period, or whatever, however many days it is. I wasn't raised liturgical or Catholic, so I'm not real up to speed on some of those practices. 
But during Lent, uh, they, most people decide to give something up that they love, like chocolate or uh, social media or sweets, as an example. And others might decide to take up something, like uh, helping more with chores around the house or uh, um, doing nice things for your friends and family. Well, these things, I believe, should be part of our life all the time, not just during Lent. Um, but I do think it's a good idea to take inventory of one's life from time to time and, and determine what might be holding us back spiritually. What things in our lives are not evil, maybe, but nevertheless take up way too much of our time that we could be seeking the Lord more fervently. You know, it's unfortunate that the only time that a lot of Christians decide to make such a decision is when things are falling apart in their lives and they need a miracle. But if you want to grow in God, listen to me, if you want to grow in God, if you want to be used of Him on a greater level, let me shoot real straight with you this morning. He's going to require more of you. This is not a salvation issue, okay? So don't read into what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you want to grow in God, if you want to be used of him in a greater way, then he's going to ask more of you. So there are certain things that you may have to lay down, like maybe too much time on video games or social media or TV or sports. And other things you may have to take up, like serving more, studying more, uh, praying more, uh, sharing your faith more, and Fasting more. In other words, make more room for Jesus. Make way for the King in your life. Don't just live your life based upon your own wits. I mean, how many of you are like me? You, you've tried living your life by your own wits. You're like, that doesn't work. <laughs> right? Make room for the king, make a way for the king in your life. And that's part of, by the way, that's part of why we're doing the Daniel challenge this year, which I hope you're all participating in. But I'm just going to read this really quick just to remind us of the Daniel challenge that we set forth at the first part of the year, because this is one of the ways that we're making a way for the king this year in our lives. Number one, read at least two chapters of the Bible every day, six days a week. Now I said Two chapters, because again, like I've said before, some of you aren't even doing that. So just start with two chapters and let it grow from there. Number two, have a time of private and quiet prayer time of at least 15 minutes per day. And again, I put at least to emphasize that it, you're really, you ought to have prayer life that's, I mean, you could feel, seriously, if you start listing off all the people who need prayer and all the different elements of your life and you just spend some time worshiping God, I mean, you can knock out 30 minutes easy just doing that. Okay, so at least 15 minutes a day. Uh, three, read four Christian books this year that help you to understand the scriptures better. Um, number four, incorporate fasting into your discipline. Start with two meals per week and then let it grow from there. Number five, set a goal in your church attendance this year of at least 45 Sundays being in the house of God. That leaves room for vacations and being out with sniffles or something every once in a while. At least 45 Sundays, you ought to be able to do that. Number six, strive to raise your standards and increase the quality of everything that you do for the glory of God. Number seven, evaluate your life and determine to raise the bar in terms of your personal integrity before the Lord. And number eight, make an impact. Look for opportunities to sow into the lives of other people. Amen. You know what, folks? You might be able to limp into heaven just the way you are right now. But who wants to limp into heaven? Not me. I, I, I want to make a triumphal entry of my own. How about you? Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't want to get into heaven with nothing to show for it. I want to get in triumphantly with reward for my labor and hearing the most precious words ever, well done, my good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. 
So, what's distracting you in your walk with the Lord? I want to remind you of something very important this morning as we start to come down home stretch here. Remember, God never asks anything of you without giving you something better in return. God never asks anything of you without giving you something better in return. But he's looking for some faith. If you just see God as someone who wants to take something from you, then you'll never turn loose of the things that he's trying you to turn loose of in exchange for something better. See, God is the ultimate giver, ladies and gentlemen. So when he asks of your time, money, and desires, it's an invitation to give ourselves more completely to him. Don't walk away like that rich young ruler did, saddened by what you think you might lose. Instead, give yourself fully to God and experience the joy of a life fully and completely surrendered to Him. Thank you for tuning in to the ministry of Blessed Life Fellowship. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe so you can get more content like this. You can support the channel by becoming a monthly supporter or making a one-time donation now. To give, go to blessedlifefellowship.org and just hit the Give button on the homepage. We appreciate your interest and support. God bless you.